Check, check. Testing, testing.
Welcome back to Mountain Minds Monday, a program of Tahoe Silicon Mountain. My name, my name is Ellen Rayner, and I'm your host for this evening. I'd like to start by thanking the sponsors who allow this to happen. Our gold sponsors, Holland and Hart, who practice many types of law, including intellectual property, which may be of interest here. Our silver sponsors, Mobo Law with offices in Truckee and Reno, Sacramento and Incline Village. They represent clients in business law, construction law, estate planning, family law, intellectual property, real estate law, and bankruptcy. Mountain Workspace is a newly opened co-working space um, back in March over in Incline. Heads Up Health, a web and mobile app designed to help you use data to master the low carb ketogenic lifestyle and you can thank them for our special platter this evening. So those are our current sponsors. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor of Tahoe Silicon Mountain, bit.ly sponsor MMM for Mountain Minds Monday, or you can email sponsorship at tahoesiliconmountain.com or ask me, we have a bunch of materials printed out that we can share with you. I'd also like to thank the individual sponsors. They do an annual sponsorship that gives them entry to Mountain Minds Monday events, including the pizza and salad, and one of either beer or wine, or two sodas, and you get to cut around the line to get in. So become a, um, an in annual individual sponsor for $150 per year. Do that right online. You don't have to wait at the front desk. So I'd like to move to the main event and introduce our speaker. And so our topic tonight is how the Internet of Things will transform your daily life. And such an impressive resume, I'm actually just going to read the introduction. Daniel Price, who you met during introductions, is the CEO of Breadware. Daniel is passionate about the new opportunities that are being unlocked in our personal lives and our businesses in the era of intelligent, connected devices. A leading thinker in IoT, Internet of Things, Daniel is a sought-after speaker and has given TEDx talks and addresses at numerous national conferences on new business opportunities in the Internet of Things. Daniel is a Rhodes Scholar and holds an MBA and Master's in Biomedical Engineering from Oxford University. Daniel attended UC Berkeley for his undergraduate, where he graduated summa cum laude with a BS degrees in bioengineering, electrical engineering, and computer science. Three degrees? Wow. Well, I give you Daniel, our speaker for the evening. Go Bears. Yeah. <laughs> Good night. A couple more than I expected. Thank you so much for the introduction, Ellen, and really big thank you to Tahoe Silicon Mountain for having me. Um, you know, what a great place to hang out, have some beer, eat some pizza, and talk about interesting topics, right? Like, this is awesome. I'm excited to be here. So, what I want to talk about today is how the Internet of Things will transform your daily life, and also maybe in some ways how it already has transformed your daily life. So I'm curious, I want to do a quick poll. How many folks here in the room wear a, you know, some sort of bracelet around their arm that keeps track of how many steps they take during the day, how well they're sleeping, right? All right, all right at least a few. Um, and do you use it? Do you, do you look at the fitness data? All right, so and, you know, how often do you look at it? And has it, has it made you exercise more, or has it, has it affected the way that you, you, know, you think about exercise at all? Or? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Well, let me ask you another one. How many people here, if you got called by your you know, son, daughter, brother-in-law, what have you, and they were standing on your front porch, you could pull out your phone and unlock the front door for them, let them in? Anyone? No, I don't like it. <laughs> You'd like it? All right. No, I won't. All right. Um, and, well, how about this one? So the Amazon Alexa or the Google HomeKit, how, how many have used one of those devices to purchase, say, a song or purchase paper towels or purchase something, right? It's so nice, right? You say, Alexa, you know, order me, order me 20 paper towels, right? To ship them to me, all right? You know. But think about it. Think about how bizarre this is, right? There's, there's this product that's in your home, right? All you have to do is speak to it, and all of a sudden this ripple effect then cascades, right? 
Amazon already is storing where you live, right? It's, they're already storing your credit card number. All you've done is talked to this device in your home. The information's been sent up, stored on the Amazon database, right? That information is then given to USPS, right? And then the next day, the tape, paper towel rolls right up at your home. So it's, it's, it's bizarre, right? And this is the world that we're already living in. And, you know, I might be able to go into your house and speak in a voice semi-similar to yours and order 200 paper towels, right? Or maybe a whole bunch of DVDs, right? What's, what's preventing me from doing that? So, so we're gonna spend a little bit of time not only talking about the excitement that's coming from Internet of Things and how it might change our life, but also some of the things just to be aware of, be wary of, pay attention to as this new technology is rolling out. What are the concerns that we should have? So, let's see. Let me first just give you a little bit of context. Breadware is, is my company and, and Larry's VP at Breadware. We're located in Reno, Nevada. And we work with businesses that are building these Internet of Things products, right? We work from startups all the way up to big conglomerates that are looking to add connectivity to a product and work through the security challenges, the manufacturing challenges, the technology challenges that come with it. So I love the role and I love the job because we get to see such interesting products, right? Like the world is starting to innovate. They're being creative. How can we add connectivity to things that we wouldn't have thought of? Trash cans, toilet paper rolls, um, you know, various watches, earrings. What can we do with technology if we put it in new places? So that's the world I get to live in every day. And I just want to share some of the insights and some of the interesting things that I've seen with the group today. Did I hear you say toilet paper? I did. Um, go look at what Target has done on their most recent Indiegogo campaign. N never want for toilet paper again, right? Just when it gets low, the toilet paper roll knows that it's low, orders new toilet paper. So I'm not, I'm not trying to dwell on the, the more zany, obscure things. I'm just trying to point out that the business opportunities that are being unearthed by this technology are far reaching and they're going to affect our lives in ways that you might not have expected. So, all right, um, Ellen, Ellen gave a mouthful about me already. The point is I'm a geek. I like thinking about this stuff. Um, from the intros I heard in the room, I know that I'm not the only geek in here. So I'm glad to see that there's a little bit of solidarity. And, and I hope you guys have some fun with this content. So, what is this Internet of Things deal? So really there's, there's three things that are going on here. Number one is that the definition of what a product is is changing. A product is not just something physical um, that you purchase and then you have and you eventually throw away, right? The product is now becoming laced with software. Like think about you know how exciting the Apple was back back when the Apple One, Apple II were getting up and started, right? And there was an operating system. Now everything has an operating system, right? So physical products are becoming blended with software. And so more and more of these products are now becoming intelligent and connected. So what does this mean, right? What's the big deal here? Why do we care? Well, let me give you an example. And this may not be an example of anything that you would want in your home, but I think it'll certainly create some of these points a little bit more visceral. Has anyone heard of Brad the Toaster before? Yeah. Yeah? I love, I love Brad the Toaster. I talk about him every chance I can get. It's actually not a real product. It was a, um, it was a master's report and test done by a student in Europe, um, I think it was Spain, but he created this in order to demonstrate the new world that we may be living in. So Brad the Toaster, also known as Brad the Moody Toaster or Brad the Needy Toaster, he's connected to the internet and he wants to make toast. That's his, that's his purpose in life, right? I want to make toast, I want to make as much toast as I can. Um, that's Brad. And he's got a couple features that are interesting. Number one, he can sense if you're in the room, right? So he can sense if you're in the room, and he wants to make toast, right? So if you're in the room, you're you know, mucking around doing something else, he's gonna try and get your attention. So he can, he can wiggle his little toaster handle at you, right? Hey, I'm over here, I'm over here, make some toast. Um, he's also connected to the internet. So he, he's connected to social media, he has his own Facebook account, right? So if he's feeling neglected, he'll say, oh, you know, kinda, kinda slow day around here. He's also connected to Amazon Pantry, right? So Maybe you need a reminder, maybe you're out of bread. Brad can go ahead and order like 12 loaves of bread for you, right? Just get that shipped to your house. Maybe you need that spark in order to build, make your toast. Um, but let's say you continue, you can continue to ignore Brad, right? You just, you know, 
You're not making toast. Maybe you never have time in the morning. He can post a sales ad for himself on Craigslist, right? He can find a new home where someone's actually going to use him and make some toast. So, all right, so maybe you don't want Brad in your home. There's a few of them out there, and you can actually go to the Brad the Toaster website, and you can see the different Brads that are deployed around Europe, and, and you can see how they're feeling, right? If, you know, if they're happy, they're making a lot of toast or not. And you might be able to buy one on Craigslist if one decides it needs a new home. So, all right, so this is the Internet of Things. All of a sudden, there's, there's even personality, right, within these devices. But there's certainly communication, intelligence, and various ways to make our lives more efficient um, or more convenient. My point is that we've actually been being prepped for IoT for a while, right? Or maybe particularly our children. Um, I consider these IoT toys, right? Or maybe the Beauty and the Beast, right? Maybe this wasn't in the past, maybe this was in the future where we had talking teapots and lanterns and clocks, right? Or cars. The, um, the new Tesla was released, right? That's the first self-driving car. And what's so interesting about the Tesla is it, the Tesla Model X wasn't initially self-driving when people were first buying the Tesla Model X. It was in fact a software update that they pushed to the cars overnight one day. So you came back to the car, the car had updated itself in your garage, and all of a sudden it had self-driving capability. So the owners of the Tesla Model X got to go and read about the new capabilities that their car had just decided to upgrade itself to. Very interesting world. So what is an IoT device, right? It's probably not um, you know, the, the French Candelera from Beauty and the Beast. What is it? So it's, it's three things. It's devices that are aware, autonomous, and actionable. The three A's of IoT. So aware means these devices have sensors, right? They're, they're, they're in some way able to sense the world around them. Not necessarily the same five senses that we as humans have, but you know, any, any one of a myriad of sensors, temperature sensors, proximity sensors, color sensors, right? They're in some way collecting data. They're autonomous because they use this data to create action, to make decisions, um, you know, to open and close doors, right? They can use the data and autonomously cause an event. And they're actionable because the data that gets collected also goes to the internet, right? And so th the company that's making these, or you if you have many of these, can look at these large data streams and use this to make decisions. The way that Tesla, now to hit that example again, is improving their self-driving algorithms is by collecting the data feed, the visual feed, the decisions the car was making, from now a mass amount of users all across the globe, right? And they're using that to be actionable and continue to improve their algorithms. So the three A's of IoT, and a couple IoT examples. So we're, we're hitting a couple different industries here. Top left, these are some of the various uh, wearables, right? So the Fitbit is there, I think the Apple Watch might be there, or the Garmin. Um, various consumer products that are really becoming integrated and part of our bodies, right? And what's so interesting is, remember when everyone thought we were gonna be addicted to screens not that long ago? Where are the screens on these devices, right? The, the interface through which we interact with these products is changing. It's becoming more human, more organic, right? That device literally senses your, you know, your normal human motions and uses that to provide data back to you to um, you know, improve your fitness, hit habits that you want to hit. Another consumer device, the tracker. Anyone have a tracker? Anyone here have it on their keychain key or in their wallet? So in 2017, this was the most widely sold consumer tracking device. You could put it on your kids, on your dog, in your wallet, on your keys, right? Anything that you didn't want to misplace or lose, you'd throw these little $20 trackers on it, then you have a phone app and it would tell you where these products are. Uh, this one's actually Bluetooth. Um, so the Bluetooth ones are the lower cost. There are, there's another tier up, slightly larger, which would be the cellular ones, right? And so the Bluetooth ones, you can only track, say, if it's still in your home, if you generally lose your keys. If you have a dog that runs several miles away, right, then you'd want a cellular tracker, um, such as the whistle dog tag. Um, and then you could see them anywhere that, as long as they're in cell service. One of my favorites over here, uh, this is called the Da Vinci Robot by Intuit. There, I know there are some physicians in the room. Have, have you heard of the, the Da Vinci Robot before? So. So this robot, it's actually, it has four arms. It's used for laparoscopic surgery. It's controlled by two physicians at once, each one controlling two of the arms, their hands. 
Um, and, and they've sort of put their eyes into this augmented reality type view where they're able to see out of the camera of this machine. What's so fascinating to me about the Da Vinci robot is it allowed for the first ever transatlantic open abdominal laparoscopic surgery. There was a clinician in the, in the UK that had a special set of skills, right, and was the only person who could do this for a very dire need patient in the US, right, and that's something that's enabled by Internet of Things. And then the Tesla, which you just talked about. So remember the three A's. What's not an Internet of Things product? Well, it's not Internet of Things if it's not aware it's not autonomous and it's not actionable, right? So, so here's a remote. I would argue that it's aware, right? It's got certain sensors. It knows you know, what buttons you're pressing. But it's not going to do anything autonomously. And there's no data being collected from this. It's not actionable. Um, what about a security camera, right? So that's, that is aware. It has a sensor on it. Uh, it's you know, like it's going to collect information and store it, but that information is not being used in, in some sort of server or cloud register to, to make decisions. We're not collecting from a bunch of these cameras at once in order to do something. So it's not an IoT device. Same with these, right? Like they, they have maybe some connectivity, but it's not IoT. IoT is aware, autonomous, and actionable. So let's look at some big numbers. This is a McKinsey study where they said, all right, so this, this whole IoT deal, clearly it's kind of big. How, oh, how do we figure out how big it is, right? How do we even start to look at these connected devices and what impact they might have by 2020? That's what these numbers are for, or no, 2025. So the way they decided to do it is like, let's take a settings-based analysis of the Internet of Things. So what do I mean by that? And what do they mean by that? Well, they meant that there's many different players in the supply and value chain to create one of these products. You have the product designer, you have the manufacturer, you have component suppliers, right? There's many parties that are involved in getting these deployed. So let's look at where they're actually implemented. For example, the human health and fitness. These are products that wind up deployed on a human, wearables, right? Whether, whether it's an Apple Watch or, or earrings or connected underwear. That, I, don't, I haven't seen that yet, actually. Um, right, so th this is the human setting. Devices that are gonna wind up on us. Google Glasses would be another example. What else do we got? All right, so we got the offices setting, right? So IoT devices that are gonna wind up in our offices. Security cameras, um, Roomba robots that drive around and clean up the offices, security systems for the doors and for the um, you know, intelligence for the lighting and the utilities. What else? Smart cities, vehicles such as the Tesla. Um, smart home is in here somewhere. There it is, home right at the top. So when McKinsey did the study, they're predicting that by 2025, somewhere between $4 trillion to $11 trillion of value are gonna be produced by virtue of these technologies. Now I wanna make a caveat here, there should be a big asterisk next to these big numbers. This isn't that the businesses that are involved in these spaces are gonna make $4 trillion. They define value as money generated by the company selling the products, but more importantly, value derived by the end user. So by the owner of the smart home who, you know, has fewer chores now that they've got more smart technology, right? Or by the owner of the Tesla who has now saved themselves a two hour commute because the car drives itself, right? And can, they can now work on their computer during the drive. So 90% of the value created by these Internet of Things devices is going to be received by the end user, by the owner of the products. And that's actually a driving business factor on the way that companies are setting up the business models, the way that they're marketing the products. These products have to be hugely valuable to those who use them. Um, you know, and, and you kind of see that if, if you look at the way that we've now interacted with our Amazon Alexas or our Fitbits or our Apple smartwatches, right? They, like they're very valuable to us and that's why we're willing to give away some of these aspects of privacy. I mean, certainly we trust that the companies are doing um, kosher things with the data, right? But we still know that, uh, I, maybe we don't trust that entirely, um, but we still know that we're giving up certain aspects of our confidentiality by having these products. So there's big numbers here. Uh, there are also huge opportunities for these companies who get it. The factor, and this isn't a McKinsey study now, this is an IDC, uh, Gardner, um, Forbes. They, they've all projected this number slightly differently, but they, they wind up in a pretty similar space. 
that 40% of incumbent products, so companies that make physical products that may or may not have ever had electronics in them in the past, 40% of them over the next five years are gonna be disrupted by some type of IoT technology. So this doesn't mean that the incumbent companies are going to all go out of business, but it means that the incumbent companies be, need to be innovating over their own product lines, and they need to do so at a speed that they've never done in the past. And for many of these companies, they've never had to put electronics into a product before, right? So they've got to learn a whole new skill set in order to create these connected products. So huge opportunities to those who get it right, a lot to be lost by those who get it wrong. So here's the um, seven largest IoT startup failures over the last five years, right? And the numbers, I mean, we're not talking about small numbers here, we're talking about billion dollars Jawbone had raised before going out, you know, actually they didn't even hit asset sale. They, they, you know, they went belly up. Um, and so some of these other ones, Enjoy was an e-cigarette company. Juicero was this amazing, um, you know, like juice making machine that you would have in your kitchen, right? And they, they, they were a couple hundred million or a hundred million. Pebble, Smartwatch, Zebo. you've probably heard of some of these brands. And what was so interesting about these products is that sometimes they were technology failures, sometimes they were marketing failures, right? Just because you can make this technology, just because you can connect a juicer to the internet, you know, should you, right? There's this kind of the classic question we ask all of our customers on day one. Um, so this is sort of the standard though with any new type of disruptive technology, right? You're gonna create a tidal wave, there's gonna be winners and losers. Um, what's just so interesting about this space right now is the magnitude of dollar amount of the winners and the losers, right? We're just playing with big numbers here. So let's talk a little bit more about this business model and why it's interesting to us as um, consumers. For the businesses, Internet of Things has made pricing a product much more challenging. In the good old, good old olden days, which weren't very long ago, you would figure out how much it cost you to produce a product, and you'd multiply it by three, and you'd sell to the retailer for that amount, right? And then, you know, and you could use that to create great financial projections, and you know, like that's, that, I'm sure that's the way that this remote clicker was priced. Not so anymore. In Internet of Things, because there's this software element of all hardware products, you could think of any product as hardware or software, and then you could think of the pricing as hardware or software or some medley of both. The fascinating thing about any product that's connected to the internet is it's changed the relationship between the user of the product and the manufacturer of the product. How, how do you price software? I mean, how do you price software? Yeah. Well, I mean... Because it's totally, I mean, it's totally different. Like, a, like you said, like an automobile. You yeah. Fixed cost, you know, labor cost, and you figure out what you're Right. Well, all right, so at a high level, I mean, how, how do you price software? You could sell it for a one-time fee, you could sell it for an annual license, you could sell it based on the usage, or you could sell it based on sort of monthly package, right? That, and that would be a SaaS model. So of recent, there's been a big movement in software on having annual licenses to the monthly SaaS subscription, right? Um, no one well, uh, you know, there's product differentiation, for instance, the Tesla Model Y. And that's the manufacturer's take that. Can we use the microphone for some questions? Yeah, yeah. there is it. So what I was mentioning is that uh, it's also software is product differentiation, right? Uh, Tesla is, well, a geek like me, it's desirable because that autopilot is really a very functional right. uh, thing. And, you know, it may add $30,000 that I'm willing to pay. Whereas I can't go to GM or BMW as of yet to get something as good as that. Right. Well, and so I would carry on that point and say that this this convergence of software and hardware into products in the Internet of Things has created greater barriers, right? Greater moats around companies that are willing to invest in high quality products. You can't just create a product, or rather, it's less likely to just create a product and it gets ripped off as soon as you start manufacturing it in China and there's you know 20 different lookalikes, right? Because the secret sauce, so to speak, is now in the software, or we call it the firmware, right? That runs into the product. Um, so not only is the business model more complex, but also the, the IP, the trade secret, the various strategy around protecting competitiveness has become more complex. So yeah, thanks Steve, that's a good point. So let me, but let me draw an analogy. Um, if, if you go to thinking about 
Walmart, which is actually, I believe, still the highest revenue company in the world, um, and compared to Amazon, one of the most valuable companies in the world, actually more valuable than Walmart, one of the big differences between Amazon and Walmart was that Amazon had granularity on user behavior down to the user and down to the specific quantum activities. How long did you spend looking at a certain page on Amazon, right? And then how many other products that were similar did you click through before you ultimately decided on, you know, this particular one by XYZ brand, right? They know that for every single visitor and user of Amazon. What's Walmart now? They know how many of a certain commodity they ship to a store, right? So they, they know information down to the store level. <laughs> These stores are pretty big, you know, if anyone's ever gotten lost in a Walmart, relative to how much Amazon knows about their users and their buying behavior. That, I mean, honestly, pulling it back, that was the huge competitive advantage that Amazon had over Walmart. Companies that sold physical products never had that. So think about now Google Analytics, right? If you make a website, your, your, your marketing team is going to just have you focus on your bounce rate and on what people are looking at on your website and how long they're looking at this information, right? You sold a product, you never knew that. The best you could do is have a focus group or maybe talk to someone after they tried to return it because they don't like it anymore, right? With the Internet of Things, you know, if I were to produce this, I know how often each one of my users presses each one of these buttons, right? I know the frequency of use, I know what features they're using. The relationship between the manufacturer and the user, very different. And so then that comes to the pricing model. How am I gonna price this? I could charge the user for every time they use the product. I could charge them one cent every time you use the product, right? Some customers would pay much less than if they bought it at face value. Some customers would wind up paying a lot more. Would that be the right business model decision for my company? I don't know, couldn't tell you. I could also charge this product uh, per month. I could say, give me $20 a month. If you don't pay, I'm gonna turn off your product, right? Your TV won't work anymore. Your toothbrush won't turn on, right? You know, like, like these different ways of thinking about how the company uh, is going to charge for their products. Um, let's use the example of a drill, right? I, I think every, you know, every self-respecting American probably has a drill in their garage. How many hours a year do you use your drill? Less than one. Less than one. Exactly. Except unless you're Larry. For some reason, he's just always running it. <laughs> right? So, you know, so the companies that are, that are um, making drills, you know, these, these companies are actually looking to like, can, can we do drill rental programs, right? Can someone come in, pick up, or actually from Amazon, order a rental drill, use it, pay for how much they use it, you know, they, they're done using it, and Uber comes back, they put the drill in the Uber, right? And they, you know, and they've only paid now a dollar, and they've gotten all their drilling use for the year, rather than paying 120 bucks. There is something, there is something along those lines that I saw not too long ago where you rent the tool. Mm -hmm. I'll rent the battery. The tool's cheap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, all right. I, but I digress, I digress. Um, all right, so the prevailing IoT business models, which, which maybe you've seen some of these before, maybe you haven't. But there's, there's really three different ways, if you're going to draw very broad strokes, on how you can think about an IoT product. What are people paying for? Are they paying for the product? Are paying for the service that comes through the product? Or are they paying for the data that the product generates? So better products. So this is number one. I mean, you know, for the Hue light bulb, for the Nest thermostats, for the Ring doorbells, just products that now enable us to do things that we couldn't have done before. Um, you know, you get home and your house is already the perfect temperature, but you haven't paid too much on your energy bill because your Nest thermostat knows that you get home at 5.30, right? You kicked on the AC at 5.00 or the ring doorbell which allows you even when you're not home to let in say the delivery man so you can put a package inside your house rather than outside on the front porch right so better products these things are priced like premium products that they are but they provide us value and so we're willing to pay for that price um, other interesting aspects of internet of things business models that you're going to see in your home the razor blade model, or more recently, as, as many of us have fallen victim to, the Keurig model. Now, now there's other types of products, and, and actually I've seen a lot of them recently in the pet food arena. Um, they, you're actually buying the product, and you're getting the product at a very inexpensive rate, perhaps below the manufacturing cost, or right at manufacturing cost. But where they get you is that you're now subscribed to a repeat dog food ordering service. 
but you only get the amount of dog food that you need. It's not like it blindly sends food every week or every month. The system's able to track how much food the dog's eating, right? And it only sends you food when you need it. So you're most probably paying only for the dog food that you need. You're probably paying a premium on that, so you know. But in any case, there's gonna be many of these IoT products that reach our homes that have this sort of razor blade model attached to them. So now there's asset tracking, right? We talked a little bit about the consumer space on asset tracking. By the way, that's a bloody space. Um, so tr Tracker was the biggest one in 2017. There's another big company called Tile. That's their arch nemesis. There's another new player called Chipolo, now the new arch nemesis. Tracker and Tile both raised Series Bs in 2017 of on the order of 50 million. And about four months later, laid off half of their companies. And like I said, there's, there's big winners and there's big losers in this space. It turns out that the consumer asset tracking uh, space did not have quite a big of enough of a competitive moat around itself to provide um, security on that one product. The, the, the Chinese copycats were able to come and, and actually create very good products at very normal prices that the consumers loved. What has become very high IP and very good business models is asset tracking in various commercial and industrial spaces. Asset tracking of cows, this was actually one of the very big early IoT successes. A uh, company deployed these tags across cows, grew huge, was purchased by Google. Um, asset tracking of drones, asset tracking of uh, um, things that are being shipped, right? High value commodities. Asset tracking of fruit from the point where it's picked in the orchard all the way to the store, right? Keeping track of its temperature, its humidity, its location, so that you know you've got this audit trail that the fruit never got too hot, never got too humid. So asset tracking, very interesting space right now. So now let's look at the product is the service. Um, one of the companies that Breadboard works with is doing Internet of Things dumpsters and compactors. Sounds non-glorious, but it's actually very interesting. They call themselves the Internet of Waste. And so here's the thing. Um, the trash collection service used to have to drive around the city and go to every single dumpster and every single compactor. And actually many of them weren't very full, right? So number one, if you monitor the fullness of these compactors, the trash collection companies can optimize their routes so that they only drive to the full dumpsters. Turns out that can be a savings in some cities of 80% for these utility services. But here's the second thing that was interesting. When drivers had a slow day, you have to realize that they got paid by the amount of kilograms of waste that they picked up and they dumped into the transfer station. So what do you do if you have a slow day, right? Any, any creatives here? You pull over on the way to the transfer station, you put a bunch of boulders or rocks, right, in your truck. Huh, now you've just upped your profit quite a bit for that day, right? So how do you prevent that with these types of intelligent devices? With an intelligent dumpster, there's a, SLA, there's a service level agreement between that dumpster and that truck on how many kilograms are transferred from that truck to that dumpster. So that winds up being the point of record for payment rather than the mass dumped into the transfer station. I give that example because it's, you know, it's kind of unique, kind of bizarre, but you can see how this would be applied in all sorts of different spaces in both commercial and industrial sectors. Operational efficiency. So this is another very important one. Um, industry 4.0. Industrial II, industrial internet things. Have you guys, has anyone heard those terms before? Okay, perfect. So the thinking here is that manufacturing is all about load balancing. In, in the simplest way of thinking about it, sort of the Henry Ford era, you teach everyone to do one task, right? And then you can very clearly see, based on where the stockpile of inventory is happening, that Jimmy is just a lot slower than everyone else, right? So what was Henry Ford's policy? Fire Jimmy, find someone new, right? But Load balancing has become a very sophisticated process now in, in the way that manufacturing is done and um, supply is thought about. But what's so interesting about the Internet of Things is that now not everything is calibrated by the human operator. The machines talk to themselves, right? Remember Brad the Toaster, right? Like we're seeing Brad the Toasters now at the industrial scale making everything. So if the machines can talk to each other, they can ratchet up or ratchet down their speed, right? And this can be done 24-7, much faster than any human operator could control the assembly line. There's a company now in the Bay Area called Bright Lab. Among other things, they manufacture the one-wheel skateboard. 
which I've tried to write and I absolutely cannot. Um, they refer to their manufacturing floor as an operating system. It's very bizarre, right? Very Bay Area techy, right? Like, you know, kind of, I almost don't want to deal with it, but I do want to because I'm a geek and I like this stuff's very interesting to me. But yeah, they say all I have to do is load in the program and now my whole factory is now set up to build this new product, right? And now, now I'm gonna put on another product, no switching time, just boom, you know, run the other program. The whole operating system now is set up to run, build that other product. Predictive maintenance. So this is something that's become very interesting in the um, like large and expensive utilities world. Think about elevators, escalators, heavy equipment, um, you know, the John Deere tractors. We had what was called retroactive maintenance. Oh shoot, my tire just fell off, right? My, my, or my drivetrain broke or my belt exploded. Now what am I gonna do? So predictive maintenance is all of these things are monitored on the product. And so your car does some predictive maintenance, right? Like it, it'll tell you, hey, check engine, right? Go, go, go to the mechanic. I don't know. I'm certainly guilty of not doing it when my car tells me to. So what if, you know, what if it was also connected to my smartphone? My smartphone initially said go to the mechanic, and then it said no, really. And then it said, all right, you know what, buddy? Like if you don't pull over and get this dealt with now, like your tire's gonna fall off in three miles. So this is, this is the type of detail that we're now able to collect from these machines based on monitoring them all the time. Um, and when you can control when the service and maintenance is gonna be done, you can control when downtime occurs. So just in terms of the efficiency of the whole system, um, you know, it's, it's, it's much, much better. My wife is a gold miner. I love to say my wife's a miner. She's a brilliant geotech engineer, but she'll go out to Eastern Nevada, right, work in the mines. When one of those haul trucks goes down, I mean, you're looking at hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars an hour on downtime. So throwing a $30 device to monitor this, you know, that investment's not looking so bad. Remember I said earlier that Internet of Things is all driven by consumer value. All right, so the Trojan horse. So this is one of the more dark ones. Um, the product is the data. So this is one of those things, and, and I forgot the exact marketing of Dodge, but it's when you don't pay for the product, maybe you're the product, right? So, so a lot of these Internet of Things products that are collecting information, I said earlier, and, and you know, there's a couple of scoffs in the room, and probably rightly so, that with many of these products, you know, maybe we're trusting these companies to use the data that they collect in, in you know, upstanding ways, um, be good Samaritans. Maybe some of them are not. Or maybe some of them are, but they're just you know, doing things that wouldn't be totally comfortable to us if we knew what they were doing with the data. But think about, think about the Amazon Alexa, for example. It's, it's being sold, it's in everyone's homes at a very good rate. They're not gonna triple their manufacturing cost off of this thing. Why are they selling it like that? Well, what better way to improve your AI engine and your voice recognition engine than to have every single accent and you know, like all of these different types of family conversations, all this captured. Strictly speaking, Amazon would say that they're not collecting this information and that might be accurate, right? Because theoretically it's only woken up when you say the, the wake up word. You can believe that or not, but they're... they're <laughs> they had a big problem with one of their TV commercials. Yeah. When all over the country. Oh, yeah. They had a, a big problem with a TV commercial, and uh, everybody's who had it on that channel, their Alexas woke up. Oh yeah. And started trying to do what they were told. Um, I. Wasn't there a South Park episode too? I, I think there was a South Park episode where they were trying to intentionally wake up Amazon Alexas at people's homes and make them purchase things. <laughs> um, so, so you know, remember that these devices, their job is to connect data or to collect data. This data is being used in, in some ways to improve the product. In other ways, it's to sell it to third parties. Just be aware of that. Marketing. Sometimes the data is collected to be able to better market the product back to you. Um, we work with a company that makes medical devices and they collect data from the way that their consumers are using it so they can know if a consumer stops using it and then they can send their targeting marketing efforts that way. Hey, you know, Dr. Bob, what, you know, what, what's going on? Can I give you a discount, right? You know, like they, they can use 
the information about the frequency of the product use, the features of the product use, to be able to double down on not only their R&D efforts, but also their marketing efforts, and overall raise the business line. Um, and AI data collection, so we, we touched on that already. So what's driving Internet of Things adoption? Why are companies investing all the money involved in order to create these products? Like I'll tell you, it's not just because the products are really damn cool. Like they are cool, but there's a driving factor. And really it's three things. I don't know why you put number one on all of them. Maybe I wanted to emphasize that they're all equally important. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I just didn't pay enough attention to the numbering. I don't know why PowerPoint would have let me do that. In any case, there's, there's three things. These products are increasing both the top lines and the bottom lines for these businesses. Top lines because they're able to sell new premium products, bottom lines because they're able to optimize the way that they utilize the data um, to improve their organizational structure. So really there's three things that these products do. They improve our experience as users, they accelerate the growth of the businesses that are getting them successfully launched, and they're increasing safety in, in the places that they're being deployed in. These are the three like main reasons why a company might try and build an IoT product. So improving user experiences. Um, there's this very interesting company now who's building these pods in a mall now. It, like, it's like this little changing room type thing that you can walk into, but it's, it's got a camera that does sort of a 360 degree image of your body. Uh, and, and then it tells you what stores you could go to and what clothes that you can buy that would fit you. And it shows you the, <laughs> like, the different options that you could look if, if you purchase these clothes, right? So what is that providing to you? other than being a little creepy, it's, it's providing a very personalized user experience. And that's, I think, the big aspect about these Internet of Things products. They are personalizing the products. The company's not personalizing it. The product itself is becoming personalized to you based on your, um, your way of operating with it, your needs, your personality, your look, right? The product is figuring out how to cater to you. So improved user experiences. Accelerating growth in business. So companies are, are using the Internet of Things a little bit like, I mean, to me, it feels like the 1840s, right? Like, where, you know, like companies are just going out there, they're looking for gold. Some of them are finding it, some of them are not. But they're, they're becoming very creative in the way that they're trying to use these products to unlock new revenue streams. And what's become very interesting and, and very noticeable in the past few years. Um, is companies making partnerships with other firms that they would have never made a partnership in the past, right? This company that has been around for 100 years, fourth generation, right? They make their product better than anyone in the world, but they know they need to innovate with these Bay Area techie software types, right? If they're gonna launch an IoT product. So what does this cost? Well, TSM has now been involved with um, like hacker camps, right? Um, so like startup weekends, right? Where, where companies will be involved, they'll sponsor, they'll work with the um, companies or the startups or the students that are trying to innovate, right? And they're not just doing this passively, they're very interested in looking at how can technology be applied in new ways? How can we incorporate in this into our business? So the amount of partnerships, um, gosh, there's a, I think there's a Netflix series called Unlikely Friends, and it shows like animals, like a crocodile being friends with a panda bear, right? And you know, and like, there's this very uh, cute storyline, and, and, and they've got all these different types of unlikely friends. You see that now in the world of business, on the companies that are figuring out how to collaborate, how to innovate together, that, that never were working together in the past. And then improve safety and reducing risk. So this is one, you know, this isn't really consumer IoT stuff, but putting sensors on the work site, putting sensors on the workers, you're able to improve um, adherence to regulation. You're able to update when new legislation rolls out. You're able to update the new legislation across all the devices immediately. Um, and you're able to provide this value in terms of workplace safety that, that you couldn't have done without connected sensors that were talking to each other. So I, I actually, there's a couple case studies here. I'll just give the high level on them and then I'll open it up for Q&A. So some of the things that have been deployed that you might find interesting, um, car insurance. There's something being rolled out called UBI car insurance, user-based insurance. 
Progressive actually is, is one of the leaders in this. And I think their commercials are okay. I don't think they're the best of the insurance companies by at all. I, I like all states. Um, but Progressive is a leader in IoT insurance. And the idea here is you put this little thing in your car, you can, you can plug it into the OED port, um, and it monitors how quickly you accelerate, how fast you turn, how fast you drive, what times of day you're driving. And the interesting is today, it can only lower in your insurance, right? They're not gonna increase your rates if you're a bad driver. And that's the way that they're you know, getting people to try this out, right? Like there's only upside. It's up to you if you believe there'll only be upside forever. I would think that'd be a foolish thing to believe, right? But you know, like look, like the insurance companies are very interested in IoT. Home insurance, renter's insurance, automobile insurance, um, life insurance, right? Like, the, like being able to better know who you're insuring, your actuarial sciences can now go down to the individual. Remember, Amazon versus Walmart. All right, so IoT in action, predictive maintenance. We talked about this a little bit. One of the world's leading companies for elevators and escalators is heavily, heavily investing in Internet of Things. All their elevators now and escalators, this is Schindler, um, have Bluetooth connectivity on it. So they just can send the maintenance guy by and he can collect all the information um, on, on a daily pass. It was not too long ago that the only way to know why an escalator wasn't working was to rip up the floorboards and look at the engine, right? Um, so this is a big, it seems simple, but a big, big activity in the sort of commercial in smart city spaces. And then talking about smart city, I would argue that the leading smart city right now is um, Charlotte, North Carolina. I think 80 of their businesses in downtown came together and decided we're gonna do an initiative to try and reduce the amount of energy spend in the downtown by $20 million over five years. And so they put themselves on a shared grid where they're monitoring and meter, metering their use. Um, there were smart sensors that were controlling this grid. In just two years, it cut down the, the downtown utility spend by $8 million. And now they're more than half of the way there to their goal of hitting 20 million. So just this very cool and inspiring story of the city coming together, the different businesses saying like, hey, we're gonna invest in this, and it paying out in a pretty big way. So that's all I got for you now. Um, I hope that some of those aspects were interesting, made you think about the space in new ways. Hopefully just scary enough, but also exciting about some of the aspects that are coming from this new technology and things that we can be watching out for. So thank you very much. Yeah, multiple questions. So you touched on a little bit in the beginning with respect to you know Amazon or somebody coming in and speaking to your Amazon speaker right. and ordering something for you. So with the Internet of Things, you've got security and you have privacy and you have interconnection. So what's your take on how well the industry is doing on all three of those areas in order to, you know, is get us moving forward and a lot of companies out of their POC, you know, purgatory. Right. That, that's a brilliant question. And so the intersection between security and interoperability, I think is the most challenging question today in Internet of Things. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll be frank with you. I don't. I don't have the answer. I. This is what's talked about when you go to the national IoT conferences. You know, like the head of IoT at Samsung is, is talking about this very issue. And the reason is, is because value gets unlocked with Internet of Things when you achieve interoperability. When the um, Tesla can interface with the Uber app and your Ring doorbell, right? And like, you can easily get your IoT screwdriver delivered to your garage, right? And left inside your garage. But interoperability begets security holes like crazy, right? Because look at all these different databases that information is being stored on. So today, Internet of Things is, is more mature than it was a couple of years ago, but it's still very nascent. And things are still very much built up in silos. Companies take on the full development stack. They build their cloud database, their networking layer, their product. Uh, and then they oversee their supply chain. This is very scary because many of the companies are startups because it's just been recent that a startup can get into a hardware game, right? And so the startup, you know, they, they you ever run a marathon? And you, you just fall across the finish line, right? <laughs> so this is sort of getting their product to market. Um, and it, many of these have succeeded in getting very brilliant products to market, but what you worry about is what got skimped on, right? Was enough emphasis put into security? 
Um, the way that we look at this in the industry is that risk equals probability times impact. So what does this mean? Well, if I've got a product that it's very low likelihood that anyone would bother to hack it, and if they did, you know, wouldn't matter, wouldn't hurt anyone, someone might wind up buying five more paper towel rolls than they expected, risk is low. But high probability, high impact, start looking at your industrial centers or you know, transportation, smart grids in the city, risk is very high. So any system that's got interoperability in it, it's, it's sort of a factorial level on how much more needs to be spent on looking at the holes, doing the penetration test, doing the security um, audits of an interoperable system. I'm hoping that this gets better over the years, and we're not too far away from it, by creating horizontal platforms of excellence at the networking level, at the, at the middleware level, at the hardware manufacturing level, and the module level. But today, we still live in the world of silos. Did, did that answer your question? Um. <laughs> yes, it's, it's a complex one. It, 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 there's no answer to it yet, is sort of what I heard. Yeah. So we're working on it still. So the, you're at the ideal place because Breadware doesn't have to solve these problems. You just give the platforms for other people to solve the problem and you make the money along the way. Am I right? I would say it's it's not been quite that easy and skipping in the park. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're there That's to the business model. We're right? there to be the, the solution, right? And we, and we want to point companies to best practices. We want to steer them away from holes. But we ourselves are not tied to the success of any one of these products. I, I just have to tell you, I love every word that you speak, you utter at this presentation. It is just, I hung on every word. So thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, so, so with that, um, what I missed is the hows and whys. I love the list of failures, but I have no idea why they failed. Uh, you, you mentioned tw uh, their goal is $20 million for uh, the city of uh, Charlotte, which I've been to and I've worked for some of those companies. But how did they use the IoT to save that money? I, 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 maybe you said it, but I missed it. So I, I love to hear the, and so what? Mm -hmm. So, um, but uh, I, I obviously you and I can share that later. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Very interesting, thank, thank you. I, I have one question in regards to when you, we're um, listening about all the different products that are out there and that are coming out of the future, the, the Internet of Things. It almost seems like is there a greater disparity or class distinction that may be a, a problem in the future? I mean, if I'm a company, I want to work with people that are um, have a disposable income, and so are we trying to track or work with with people who have, have a good understanding of technology? That's a great question. And actually, I haven't been asked that question in that way before. So let, let me wing it a little bit, you know, kind of kind of see, see what you think of this. But my sense would be that we're blending hardware and software, right? That was one of the themes of my talk. Software has historically been a great leveler. If, if you look at operating systems, right, and the rise of the personal computer, if you look at the more recent social network, right, social network is the same for anyone who uses it, right? Doesn't matter what class you are when you come into it, you're speaking maybe to different folks of people in your immediate network, but you're partaking in the same platform. And so, again, with the Internet of Things, you have this software element, you have a network element to this that's trying to connect nodes being people, nodes being products, into a greater fabric. There's always going to be the various levels of monetization, and so this is, um, God, first person price discrimination. When, when you look at the way that a company can set pricing. First person price discrimination is ideal, right? Like, or segmentation. Typically companies are doing it third person segmentation. You know, they, they price it at this tier for, you know, this type of person, this tier for someone else who's gonna be a little bit more price sensitive, and then here's their base open market model, right? 
when you're a first person price segmentation, you know much more about your customer, you know about their buying habits, and so you can cater them at a price that they're gonna participate in. I think that that's what we're gonna see with these products. So I think that you're gonna see sort of widespread general availability on everyone being on the same platform. But then, you know, like look at Candy Crush. Are there any Candy Crush players in the room? There's now like 3,000 levels of Candy Crush. But you, you can like, you can purchase different things. Like you can, you can change the backgrounds and kind of like pay to, you know, like have your avatar be a little bit different and like win little prizes. It doesn't do anything for you, but people pay money for it. But everyone's still having the same experience. I'm, you know, I'm not trying to talk utopian here. There's going to be plenty of problems, but like that would be my hope on, on what you see. You have sort of a leveling effect from software, and then you have um, some price segmentation based on people willing to pay. You're going to have the people driving the Tesla Model Xs, right? And that's certainly going to provide some class distinctions. But I would hope also that your, um, you know, your Toyotas and your Volvos and your Hyundais are also self-driving, right? Like that we all have access to this type of technology. Yeah, Aaron. Not to, not to try to blow up the startup universe using two different uh, keywords, but do you see any intersection between like blockchain and IoT? And what are any thoughts on that? Like, what are some applications you might think of? Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate the sensitivity sensitivity to buzzwords. Yeah. Um, I, I always like to tell the investor types that we're an IoT company that utilizes blockchain and IoT for our big data play, right? Um, and they seem they seem to like that. But you know, I think that there's a natural intersection which has not yet been figured out. It's certainly being explored by various angles and perspectives by many companies. One of which is a local Reno company, Filament, right? Which many of you probably are aware of. Um, and I think they're just brilliant. They're doing some really interesting innovation. But blockchain being a series of distributed nodes, right, that collectively record an event. Internet of Things being a series of distributed sensors that are aware, that are making decisions, and are collecting data. Like, th there's, there's a natural intersection there. I haven't seen it yet deployed in an area where I'm like, oh yeah, that's gonna be the golden ticket. Um, but we're certainly gonna see collisions of those two fields. Thank you. Fascinating. I have a question, a couple questions. One is, it sounds like so many of these companies that you're talking about are using sensors as the form of information, where the information's coming from. And then the information coming from the sensors is getting communicated in different ways. Where are the sensors coming from? Are there multiple companies making these sensors? They're making the components of it? Like, where is that piece? Got it. Okay, so that's actually a really interesting question. It hits some of the macro currents that are happening in this space right now. Um, historically, you would have a small number of companies building a large, large number of products. You would have LG and Whirlpool making a couple million products a year, right? Today's a little bit different. There's a much larger number of companies building hardware products, and they're building them in smaller amounts. The average is in the tens of thousands of units a year that they're building. So this is changing the game for companies making sensors and companies making components. Traditionally, you have the electrical OEM. These would be companies like um, Analog Devices, Texas Instruments, Microchip. Um, they, they would make these components and, and they would sell them through scores of field application engineers who would go to LG and work on installing these components and these sensors into a new product. There are now these companies still, but there's many new boutique companies that are building what we call modular sensors. So these are things that are easier for the startup to just drag and drop into their product um, and, and make 10,000 of them. But there's not any more field application engineering army that's gonna go and work with a startup. The, like the, the, the monetization doesn't make sense, right? Startups only gonna buy a couple hundred, a couple thousand a year. So you have your, your big traditional OEMs that are component suppliers, and then you have many smaller uh, upstart companies that are building sensors at a modular level, not a component level. Um, many of them are in the US, actually, and then many of them are overseas and in China as well. It's, it's actually a very global market right now, the sensor market. It's less technical, and I thank you for uh, a, a great presentation. And it was really inspiring to hear you talk about um, the potential for um, maintenance improvement and smart cities and things. But I, I wonder, and maybe this is a question more for a priest or an ethicist, but I wonder with the Internet of Things in the retail space, when 
these these things are tracking tracking us. Are we getting mirrored the way we are in social media with my, my news feeds are being stovepiped and things? Are my are the suggestions, for instance, that that mall suggest uh, um, uh, you gave us? Are the suggestions that we're getting? Do you see with the internet things just going to be mirrored back based on my demographics and past shopping history? What are we doing to creativity um, and individuality in the retail space? Or do you see this as potential uh, liberty? Right. That question is brilliant. So, so number one, I mean, you know, like, what does social media do in order to figure out how to advertise you? They collect information about you, and then they stereotype, right? Like that, that's what it is. And so it's going to be the same thing with, with these products. Like, imagine walking through a mall, the, you know, what's presented on the, um, you know, on the advertisements or in the window displays can be catered to you, right? Um, are we going to be liberated? Do you feel liberated when you go around Google and you see ads that you know, to your taste? Like maybe, maybe it's convenient. I don't know. I don't know if it's liberating. Um, but we're going to see that now with Internet of Things in the physical domain and not just in the digital domain. So that that'll be something to, to keep an eye on and just think about. It's a lot of safe zones. No IoT allowed. Go out in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah. <laughs> I think we got to keep it to where the microphone is, and it's time to wrap up. I want to thank Daniel from Bradware for being here. Um, really interesting presentation. Fortunate to have you just down the hill in Reno. Um, if any of you have ideas for other topics you'd like to see at future Mountain Minds Mondays, um, please submit them through the Facebook group or reach out to Garrett. He's our speaker coordinator. And please do buy your tickets in advance for the pitch showcase that's just two weeks from today. Thank you all.